and Googie Detained, A Writer's Prison Diary. Preface. There is no way I could have written this prison memoir without treading on some sensitive toes, since those who were responsible for my detention, or those who were even contemplating my elimination, are still alive and well and still occupying powerful positions of authority and wealth. Although I have a fairly good account of those who are active in calling for the ban on the performances of Ngahika and Dinda at Kamaritu, and also of those who fought for my detention to teach him a lesson in submission, silence, and obedience. I have on the whole avoided mentioning names except in concrete cases when I have had to answer published criticism of my ideological position, be it in books, newspapers, or in the precincts of Parliament. As I am not socially or personally known to most of these individuals, my differences with them are neither private nor personal. They are ideological. These people saw themselves as representing certain social forces, and I as representing others. I have therefore tried to discuss detention not as a personal affair between me and a few individuals, but as a social, political, and historical phenomenon. I have tried to see it in the context of historical attempts from colonial times to the present by a foreign imperialist bourgeoisie in alliance with its local Kenyan representatives to turn Kenyans into slaves, and of the historical struggles of Kenyan people against economic, political, and cultural slavery. I have confined myself to the period between December 31, 1977 and December 12, 1978. My account starts with December 12, 1978 and ends with December 12, 1978. It is divided into two main sections, my experiences and thoughts in prison and my letters from prison. In the second section, letters from prison, I have included a letter by another detainee, Mr. A. Mathenge, to document my charge that disease was used as a means of torture. Otherwise, this is one person's account, and I hope that more detainees will write about their prison experiences in post-1963 Kenya in the same way that Mau Mau and pre-Mau Mau detainees have. The third section, Prison Aftermaths, is sketchy and consists mainly of letters and documents that reveal the collusion between the government and the university authorities to deny me employment. This is perhaps meant as a continuation of torture by other means, or as a way to encourage me to seek employment and lucre abroad, and eventually I have rejected. This collusion to deny me employment is just one of the many things that follow my detention and release. Since I have not included them in the body of the memoir or in the third section, I will here mention a few. Soon after my release, I was once arrested and falsely charged with drinking after hours. Although I was later discharged by the magistrate, I had already been subjected to a severe beating by the arresting policeman. During the same period, January to May 1979, my family and I were the victims of constant death threats. I might here also mention the press hostility led by the Hillary and Gueno group of newspapers and especially the Weekly Review. I was hardly out of prison when Hillary Ingueno sent one of his reporters to interview me, but he had given her suspiciously leading questions and also instructions on how to go about it, all heavily underlined where Ingueno wanted emphasis. Interview with Ngugi Please show Ngugi the Nation report of his interview with them and also specific questions about democracy along the following lines. A. When he says he has learnt about democracy from the peasants and the people, what exactly does he mean? B. Is he still of the opinion explicitly and implicitly contained in his recent writings and interviews, e.g. with the idea that what we have in Kenya is a sham democracy? C. Does he in particular think that to build a new Kenya one must in effect destroy all bourgeois institutions first? And do these institutions include parliament, a free press, churches, judiciaries, and all other bourgeois democratic institutions upon which the Kenyan system of politics is based? D. Given a choice in how to bring about change for the betterment of the masses in Kenya, does he believe 
evolutionary processes are as effective in the Kenya context as revolutionary ones? Due to the experiences Ngugi has had over the past year, some of the above questions may not be easy for him to answer, but it is important to get a clear idea of what his present thinking is. Signed, HBN. I looked at the questions and asked the reporter why her employees were interviewing me by proxy. I refused to be interviewed by proxy. She there and then conducted her own interview. This was in December 1978, but the interview was not published until January 1979. In the meantime, Gueno's Stelescope Newspapers LTD went on publishing news stories from the interview week by week, thus giving the impression that I was daily rushing to the press. And when at long last the whole interview was published, it was accompanied by the astonishing accusation that I was the only detainee who had not said thank you to the president for releasing me. An ingrate of an ex-detainee, I was once again guilty of the sin of omission. I could not understand the source of this post-detention hostility, especially coming from a group of newspapers I had always supported because despite their pro-imperialist line, I saw them as a hopeful assertion of a national initiative. The other newspapers in Kenya, the Nation Group and the Standard Group, are fully owned and controlled by foreign firms. A few months after the above quoted interview, I felt vindicated when I came across a memo by Hilary Gueno to his staff dated 19th, October 1979, in which he had answered one of his own questions about the freedom of the press in Kenya. He was about to close because of a disagreement between himself and the government. Memo to all staff, date October 19th, 1979, from Hillary. As we all know, we are having problems with the government at the moment. Most parastatal organizations have been instructed not to advertise with us anymore. As a result, a lot of advertising has been canceled. We have not been told why this is being done and all efforts by me to get an explanation have failed so far. What is more important, I do not know what the intentions of the government actually are, whether to kill our newspapers or simply punish us for something we have published. What I do know is that we cannot continue operating as we are without advertising. Advertising is what makes it possible for a newspaper to survive or grow. Without money from advertising, we cannot make ends meet. It is true that we can exist for a while without advertising from government or parastatal organizations, but only for a while. For in due course, private advertisers are also going to stop advertising with us for fear they may themselves get into trouble. This memo is to let you know that at the moment the future of our operations is not bright at all. All of you have personal and family commitments which must come first in your consideration of your own future. For this reason, I would like each one of you to know that I sympathize with you over the uncertainty in which this new turn of events has placed you. As I cannot guarantee that you will have a job in two months' time, I would urge those who feel they can best serve their interest by looking for alternative jobs to do so. How can anyone talk about the freedom of the press when that very press is largely dependent on foreign capital for survival? How can it be free when its very survival and growth is dependent on the goodwill and approval of advertisers? Obviously, Gueno was indirectly admitting the primacy of finances in restricting basic freedoms. There was an attempt, a subtle attempt, in many of the post-prison interviews to make me say that things had changed for the better in Kenya after Kenyatta's death as if Kenyatta solely and alone was responsible for Kenya's neo-colonial mess. I have never tried to analyze the Kenya situation in terms of the morality of individuals and tribes, as is the fashion and current scholarship. Capitalism cannot be run on any basis other than theft and robbery and corruption. The situation is much worse in a dependent capitalism, as in the case in Kenya and elsewhere. In a neo-colony, foreign capital aided by a corrupt bourgeoisie becomes so arrogant that it even pokes its fingers into the noses of a fledgling national capital and growls, Out of my way, fella. Let me and me alone exploit the labor of your workers. 
when some of the nationals complain, the owners of foreign capital, i.e. the imperialist bourgeoisie or their spokesmen, act hurt and uncomprehending. What's wrong with some of you? We are creating employment for your people. Without us in New York, London, Bonn, Paris, Rome, Stockholm and Tokyo, where would you people be? Unfortunately, some Kenyans who can see through the holy pretensions of the imperialist bourgeoisie are not willing to do anything about it, even when they can see the threat to their own national interest. At the height of the debate over the Kenyan National Theater, during the preparatory years for the Second World African and Black Festival of Arts and Culture, 1975, 76, and 77, I met a young Kenyan industrialist who told me, I see that you people are talking about the domination of Kenyan culture by foreign cultural interest. You people don't know what you're talking about. Come to the industrial area and we can tell you where the real domination is. He was of course right about the primacy of foreign economic domination in Kenya. He could not of course see that cultural domination is precisely a result and a reflection of economic and political domination and that we were only stating what we believe to be the objective cultural position of this nation in view of the foreign onslaught. But this is not the point. The point was, what was he going to do as a result of his knowledge? I asked him, but what are you doing about it? Why don't you raise your economic voices against the situation? He quickly drove away. Democracy and justice can only be achieved when the various interest groups voice their positions and fight for them. Until democratic-minded Kenyans, workers, peasants, students, progressive intellectuals, and others unite on the most minimum basis of a patriotic opposition to imperialist foreign domination of our economy, politics, and culture, things will get worse, not better, no matter who sits on the throne of power. No country can consider itself politically independent for as long as its economy and culture are dominated by foreign interests. I have been able since my release to gather interesting incidents leading to my incarceration. I am told, for instance, that sometime in December 1977, two gentlemen very highly placed in the government flew to Mombasa and demanded an urgent audience with Jomo Kenyatta. They each held a copy of Petals of Blood in one hand and in the other a copy of Engahika and Dinda. The audience granted, they then proceeded to read him, out of a context of course, passages and lines and words allegedly subversive as evidence of highly suspicious intentions. The only way to thwart those intentions, whatever they were, was to detain him who harbored such dangerous intentions. They pleaded. Some others had sought outright and permanent silencing in the manner of J.M. Karayuki. But on second thoughts, this was caused for national stability. And so to detention, I was sent. Many people speculated as to the reasons for this detention, some in public, some privately. In the absence of any reasons being given on any charges made officially, this speculation was inevitable. Some of it was based on rumor and some perhaps on concrete facts or on misleading official leakages. Such seems to be the case with Hillary and Gueno's papers. Thus, after my arrest, the weekly review of January 9, 1978 carried the following. Late Wednesday afternoon, however, word was going round that Googie had been detained because of the Chinese and other literature found in his possession at the time of the police search in his study. This particular speculation was apparently based on invention, rumors or false information from officials. My detention order was signed by then Vice President Mr. Daniel T. Arap Moy on December 29, 1977. I was arrested on the night of December 30th and 31st, 1977. My detention could not therefore have been connected with anything found or not found in my study. The invention or the rumors or the false information may have had foundations occasioned by the government's refusal to make public my fate. What's surprising is that the weekly review saw it fit to repeat the speculation even after my release. Incidentally, all publications and manuscripts found were returned, and no charge on banned books was made. A fact the press knew in 1978. 
Another speculation is contained in a paper by Ali Mazrui entitled The Detention of Ngugi Wa Tiango Report on a Private Visit. Gugi's acknowledgments of Soviet support in the process of his writing a critique of Kenya's economy may have played a bigger role behind his detention than many assumed. This more likely was a deliberate invention. I went to Yalta in the Soviet Union in 1975. I was arrested and detained in 1977. My visit was not a secret. Even the Kenya ambassador in Moscow hosted a reception for me. Before and after 1975, many Kenyans visited the same country and stayed much longer than I did and with dissimilar consequences. Petals of Blood was started in Evanston, Illinois, USA. The bulk of it was written in Lemuru, Kenya, the rest in Yalta. I was in Evanston for a year and in Yalta for a month, in Lemuru for most of my lifetime. The link between Ali Mazrui's and Henry Guaino's literary speculations is the obvious intent, like Colonel Summerhow in the trial of Jomo Kenyatta, to bring in a Chinese or a Russian connection in order to gloss over the issues raised. In this, Haleri Nguyeno went further than Ali Mazrui. Mazrui defended my right to write without state harassment, but Nguyeno was virtually advancing an ideological justification for my detention, and this on the basis that I had never condemned repression in the Soviet Union or North Korea. Thus, the same issue of the Weekly Review, after rambling on about my literary career, no indication by tone, word, or any gesture that the Weekly Review was concerned about the state harassment of writers, came back with a bold ideological offensive. Part of Gugi's problem seemed to be that, as he has moved farther to the left of the country's political ideological spectrum, he has tended to operate in a world which does not allow for objective appraisal of political realities, not only in Kenya, but in other parts of the world. A year ago, shortly after a visit to Japan sponsored by a leftist writers organization, he published an appeal to the South Korean government to release from detention one of South Korea's poets and authors, Kim Chi-ha. In the same article, Ngugi went out of his way to castigate the repressive regime of President Park Chung-hee, but as in many of his comments on the international scene, he left the impression that the equally repressive regime in North Korea was far more acceptable than the one in the South. Ironically, Googie's article appeared at the same time as North Korea was undergoing one of its most humiliating diplomatic experiences, with dozens of its diplomats from even neutral countries like Denmark and Sweden being thrown out for indulging in widespread smuggling of cigarettes and liquor in an attempt to help the sagging foreign exchange position of the North Korea communist regime. And Googie who has been to the Soviet Union on a number of occasions, has never publicly uttered a word against the treatment of writers in the Soviet Union, who, for one reason or other, have earned the displeasure of the Kremlin authorities. It is as if the whole dissidents' movement in the Soviet Union and other communist countries was to Gugi as the Soviet and communist authorities claim, an intellectual embarrassment or nothing but the figment or machinations of the Western imperialist forces. The aim of such speculative journalism, as in Newsweek and Time magazines, is to shift the debate from the issue of suppression of democratic rights and of the freedom of expression to a bold discussion and literary posturing about problems of other countries. They are worse than we are, therefore we are better. In fact, we are the best in Africa, the best in the Third World, and African Switzerland. Anyone who says that the worst of another country does not make the bad of ours better or best is a heretic. He is a rebel. He is a leftist. He is a socialist. He is a communist. Chain the devil. I was, after detention, the subject of all sorts of accusations. One accusation is very clear in the same write-up referred to above in the weekly review of January 9, 1978 and can be summed up in one sentence. To be a leftist, whatever that means, is a crime. A similar accusation is contained in a letter from Ali Mazrui to Z. Jomo Kenyatta, dated 
January 16, 1978, asking for the immediate release of all those in detention. After reminding Kenyatta about the fact that some years before, Masrui and I had sought permission to do a joint biography of Kenyatta, which was refused, Masrui continued, In your wisdom, perhaps that decision was right. For one thing, since 1967, Gugi Tiango has ideologically become more radicalized. Such normative divergence would probably have made a biographer's relations with his subject more complicated. But I believe Gugi is still a great patriot in his own way and loves Kenya by his own light. He and I have probably moved further apart since those old days of our deliberations about your biography more than a decade ago. I am basically a liberal. Gugi has become more of a leftist radical than ever. But I believe ideological differences have not reduced our respect for each other. Masrui's letter should be seen in the context of his emphatic call for freedom of expression, for toleration of different ideological positions, and for the release of political prisoners. Professor Masrui even joined the London demonstration outside the Kenya High Commission demanding the release of political detainees, and he has consistently raised his voice whenever he gets the chance about my fate and plight during my detention and after. But Agueno's accusation was followed by very dangerous suggestions. Writers, journalists, instead of struggling to extend the frontiers of intellectual and literary freedom, should exercise self-censorship. Against that call for self-censorship enters the devil. No, the naive ideologue who knows not the limits of liberal dissent. The same Weekly Review article continued. During the past year or so, Googie has acted the part of ideologue rather than writer, and he has done so with increasing inability to relate in the limits of the sphere of an author's operation, which is possible in a developing country in areas where ideas, however noble, can be translated into actions, which have far-reaching implications to the general pattern of law and order. What are the limits of the sphere of an author's operations? The Weekly Review talked as if this was a norm known by everybody, except, of course, ideologues. These were the years that I had written and published Secret Lives, Petals of Blood, and co-authored The Trial of Didan Kimati with Masire Mugu and Ngahika De Inda with Gugi Vamiri. On top of my administrative and teaching duties at the university, Yet, I had acted the part of ideologue rather than the writer, for ideology-free writers turned to the weekly review. But quite a few others were not content with accusations. They started attacking me even though they knew well I was not in a position to answer back. One even wrote what amounted to an obituary and referred to me in the past tense. This was before the regime had announced my whereabouts. The attacks were led by the former attorney general. Charles Mugani and Jonjo. In a speech in Parliament on the training of lawyers reported in the Weekly Review of June 23, 1978, Jonjo subtly veered from pronouncements on law to denouncement of the literature department and on those who preferred Kenyan names to English ones. Regarding the Department of English, incidentally no such department exists. I would like to ask the assistant minister who is here today to ensure that we have teachers who have the right qualifications for this department. Some of the people teaching in this faculty, incidentally a faculty consists of several departments, think that if you call yourself Kamu Wal Joroge, you are a very important lecturer or a lecturer with a lot of know-how. You no longer call yourself James Kamau. If you want to be promoted higher, it is better to call yourself Kamu Wa Jiroge. The point was not missed. Even the weekly review was able to point out that this was an aside obviously aimed at the former head of the department, the novelist Gugi Wa Tiango, who is now in political detention. There was, of course, every reason to make Charles and Jonjo attack me, even while I was in detention. It is not merely a question of background, 
He is the son of a colonial chief while I am the son of a peasant, but more of a difference in the perception of our roles vis-a-vis -vis the struggle of Kenyan national culture against foreign imperialist cultures. Since 1975, I had consistently criticized the domination of our lives by foreign imperialist interest and especially at the Kenya Cultural Center and the Kenya National Theater. I had in particular singled out the concrete examples of the city players and the theater group, all foreign, all European. Charles Njonjo was the patron of the city players. I have also consistently criticized the British chairmanship of the governing council of the Kenya Cultural Center and the Kenya National Theater. Montgomery, of British royal ancestry, was the chairman of the governing council. He works in the attorney general's chambers. He is also the supervisor of elections and the secretary of the Council for Legal Education. I am not sure that having an English Christian name would have deterred me from the task of exposing imperialist cultural domination or spared me the attacks from those not opposed to imperialism. Only that, as charity begins at home, I had to start by rejecting the slave tradition of acquiring the master's name. In fact, the most interesting attack on me did not emanate from Charles and John Joe. At least he is forthright and honest about the side he has taken. Such a man deserves respect for his unwavering, single-minded, and principled defense of his pro-imperialist position, even though you may disagree with him. But from petty bourgeois intellectuals at the university who hide ethnic chauvinism and their immortal terror of progressive class politics behind masks of abstract supranationalism, and bury their own inaction behind mugs of beer and empty intellectualism about conditions being not yet ripe for action. But at the same time, they are scared of openly attacking peasants and workers. So they talk progressive and act conservative. They wear a populist intellectual mask in order the better to attack any concrete cases of worker-peasant anti-imperialist struggles. To them, my detention proved them right in their caution, and they could now hide their refusal to defend the democratic rights of free expression by openly attacking me. To attack me was safer in those days, perhaps a little remunerative. They could sit down and advance beautifully balanced arguments, footnotes, weighty phrases and all that, justifying my detention. He was a Gekuyu. He was a leftist. He was a communist. But worse... He was a Gaikuyu, and he wrote about peasants and workers. In the paper already referred to, The Detention of Gugi Watiango, Report of a Private Visit, dated April 20, 1978, Ali Mazrui was able to record the views and position of this group of academics. A number of Gugi's colleagues at the University of Nairobi do view Gugi primarily as a Kikuyu. One or two went further than that, asserting that Gugi himself is partly a Kikuyu nationalist and only partly a Marxist radical. Part of the evidence is drawn from the heavily Kikuyu centrism of Gugi's national life. Secondly, it was suggested to me that Gugi's recruitment policies as head of department included a partiality for Kikuyu candidates. I have not checked this yet. But it was alleged that half the Department of Literature at the University of Nairobi consisted of Kikuyu and prospects for an increased percentage of Kikuyu were high. Even if Gugi was not responsible for the favoritism of fellow Kikuyu, it was argued he did not put up a fight against it. The fourth factor cited concerning Gugi's Kikuyu centrism concerned the colleagues he collaborated with. The work he jointly authored had fellow Kikuyu collaborators, although the themes were supposed to be of national significance. Note, Kikuyu is the largest ethnic group in Kenya. Kikuyu is derived from the Swahili Gekuyu. End of note. The fifth argument used concerning Gugi's Kikuyu centrism was his alleged indifference to the teaching of Swahili literature in the Department of Literature at Nairobi, while at the same time supporting the study of oral ethnic literature in the hope that the Kaikuyu contribution under his heading would inevitably be largest.
Objectively, Swahili literature, both written and oral in Kenya, as well as in Tanzania, is by far the most dynamic branch of East African literature alive today. Secondly, Swahili is in any case the national language of Kenya, and the classical literature of Swahili came disproportionately from Kenya rather than from Tanzania. And yet, although Gugi's headship at Nairobi did encourage greater study of the literature of the outside world from the Caribbean to India, on the home front, Gugi had allegedly ignored the Swahili heritage and was beginning to work hard towards giving greater prominence to the literary heritage of the Kakuyu. His own play in Kakuyu, which got him into political trouble, might have captured the two parts of Gugi's ideological position. Kakuyu centrism on one side and radical universalism on the other. All these were allegations by others. How does one begin to answer such unprincipled attacks? By pointing out that Swahili literature was taught in the Department of Literature since 1969? But being honorable academics, they could have easily checked this in the syllabus. By pointing out I was instrumental along with others in the abolition of the old style English department and the setting up in its place the present Department of Literature and the Department of Linguistics and African Languages. But being learned men, they could have read the appendix in my book Homecoming. By pointing out the composition of the staff of the Literature Department nationality by nationality and comparing this with the composition of other departments. But being members of the university, they could easily have checked the staff list in the university's annual reports. No, these attacks had better be passed over in silence. These petty bourgeois academics fit into the category of intellectuals once described by Karl Marx as geniuses in the ways of bourgeois stupidity. Against all that was the overwhelming support of the political detainees from our 14 million Kenyans, ordinary people, peasants and workers, students, who thronged the streets when they heard about our release. Of course, not all the intellectuals mounted these accusations and attacks. There were some who very courageously fought on the side of democratic forces and tirelessly worked for the release of detainees. There was also the worldwide struggle for the release of prisoners in Kenya from workers, writers and humanist organizations, progressive intellectuals, democratic-minded individuals from Africa, Asia, Europe, Canada, Australia, the USA, and Latin America. My writing this memoir and letting all these people in Kenya and abroad share my prison experiences is my way of expressing my undying gratitude to them all for their acts and words of solidarity. End of preface. Please support this channel by clicking the links below.